Eugene, thank you very much for spending the time to talk to us. I've um, got a number of questions here that have been offered by students from Plymouth University. And the first one, very easy question to answer, I'm sure it's a, a very quick response here, which is, uh, how has the threat landscape changed since you first established Kaspersky Lab? For example, are the attackers and their victims still broadly the same, or has the focus of attention shifted? Uh, well, my company was uh, founded in uh, 19, 1997, so it's almost 16 years ago. And, uh, well, actually, the uh, threat landscape changed uh, a lot and several times. Uh, in 1997, there were no internet worms. There were no uh, well-known internet attacks which uh, employ vulnerabilities and which spread through the internet. There were just uh, the uh, traditional, the old-style computer viruses uh, written by teenagers, mostly by uh, script kiddies, uh, we call them in this way. So there were no financial motivation behind these attacks. Uh, later, there were first internet worms like uh, I love you, Melissa. And also, there were no financial motivation, and they were not. They were. They were well. They were hooligans. They were vandals, uh, not criminals. But then, uh, there were first criminals. Uh, first criminal attack in the internet. Uh, they came just after the first uh, uh, internet services, which were, which were possible to convert to the cash money. I'm talking about. That was even before online banking. Uh, there were first uh, internet money uh, services like uh, e-gold, like web money. Uh, so uh, their criminal attacks focused on these services. They came just after these services were introduced. That was in the very, very early 2000s. And there were individual criminals and there were no organized groups. And that changed somewhere in the middle of 2000s. And uh, now we see there are many international criminal gangs in there in the cyberspace and millions of the attacks. But it's not just about criminal attacks uh, because now we see many very complicated and uh, I will say uh, very professional attacks which have uh, quite a big budgets uh, behind them. So uh, I'm not talking about attribution. I don't know who is behind these attacks because it's not our job to find it. Uh, but I'm not surprised if there are states uh, behind uh, the high complexity and high profile espionage attacks. And uh, it's not the worst. Uh, I think the worst is uh, the it's attacks on the critical infrastructure, attacks on the critical IT systems, attacks on critical industrial environment, and attacks on telecommunications. So, uh, when I started my company, there were only computer viruses written by uh, mm, computer vandals. Mm -hmm. Now there are criminal attacks, organized criminal gangs, uh, massive espionage attacks and cyber sabotage in the cyberspace. So now uh, the threat landscape is absolutely different. It's well, it's like comparing the, the mountains uh, with a sunny beach. So, so the landscape has got worse for, well, you already mentioned for organisations um, in terms of things like the critical infrastructure attacks. How about for individuals? Um, would you say that individuals can now feel any safer online if they're using appropriate security technologies to try and safeguard them? Or have they still got to have the same level of awareness and alertness as before? It's a yes and no at the same time. Uh, the modern security technologies, they are much, much better than in the past. But unfortunately, the cyber criminals, uh, the bad guys, they are much more professional. Uh, and of course, uh, they're, well, it's like, a, it's like an evolution. So the stupid criminals, which are not able to bypass the, their modern protections, they just, they, they left the business. Uh, but there are many very, very clever uh, criminals which use uh, social engineering, their uh, vulnerabilities, uh, they are able to develop such attacks which are uh, just uh, cracking the, uh, the protection. And this is, uh, it, it's not, the IT security, uh, it's not a product or technology which you install and forget about that. Uh, this is uh, all the time, uh, well, upgraded, updated uh, technology we need to uh, updated to, to protect you against their more sophisticated attacks. It's, a, it, it's an arm race. It's like the same like fight with uh, traditional criminals and uh, terrorists in the streets. Uh, the traditional police is getting 
more and more experienced it and more powerful but the bad guys uh, in the real world they also get more experienced and more creative uh, so it's it's an endless war and we simply have to be more strong than our opponents are. Mm. I think leading on from that, I think it's fair to say we now face malware threats, for example, across a much wider range of devices and services than we did in the past. You alluded to that in your original response. So I think malware on smartphones and tablet devices is possibly a good example here. So do you think users, end users and organisations that rely upon these technologies are facing up to the threat that exists on these platforms? Well, in short, uh, my answer is yes, you are right. Mm. Uh, in more details, uh, we, we are collecting thousands of the new malware for smartphones and uh, this number is growing very, very quick. Uh, actually, it's almost the same uh, what happened with the computer viruses and the internet worms in the past. Uh, there were like a plateau and growing of the new samples, mm -hmm. number of new samples, uh, like one, two samples a month, uh, a week, uh, then hundreds a year. Uh, then 1,000 a year, then 10,000, then 10 million a year. So the malware for smartphones and tablets, it's, it's following exactly the same way. And most of the malware is written for Android. Uh, so I'm afraid that now the mobile users, they are facing exactly the same uh, problems which uh, computer users were facing maybe 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the cyber criminals which are behind these attacks, they are also getting more and more experienced. And uh, I'm afraid the uh, security situation with smartphones, especially with Android, uh, will be exactly the same as with computers, which we have at the moment. And it's not only about smartphones. Uh, what about the new, uh, new TV sets, uh, which are also mm -hmm. Android-based? Uh, what about uh, other devices which are connected to the Internet? Uh, so I'm afraid that situation with uh, uh, mobile, mobile networks and mobile uh, devices we will be even worse because it's mobile, uh, mobile uh, operating system, it's uh, not only in our computers, in mm -hmm. smartphones, tablets, it will be everywhere. Uh, so I was talking only about Android, what about the rest of operating system, mm -hmm. especially iOS. Uh, iOS is a very different operating system and uh, Apple uh, is a very different company. Uh, they don't let us and uh, well, other uh, so IT security companies uh, to develop a true endpoint security solution because it's a Apple policy uh, and they don't let uh, companies to get too deep access to the to the kernel of operating system a lot but the reality is that uh, the iOS the operating system uh, for I iPhones and iPads it's vulnerable as well uh, unfortunately technically it's possible to jailbreak it and mm -hmm. uh, without user interaction it's possible to hack it and using exploits. Uh, so technically, I'm afraid the scenario when the smartphones, iPhones and uh, iPads, they are hacked and infected, I'm afraid the situation is very possible. And uh, this scenario maybe is a worst case scenario for iPhone and iPads users. Mm -hmm. A situation when your device is infected, but there is no help from IT security companies because we can't do that. And Apple itself, as a Apple corporation, uh, I'm afraid they are not ready for true infection scenarios for the iPhones and iPads. Mm. Yes, I mean, you, you mentioned before that a lot of the, well, the vast majority of the current malware detections and signatures is on the Android platform. Is that perhaps suggesting up to now Apple's approach has been effective or do you think they've just been lucky that attention hasn't turned wholeheartedly to trying to find the sort of vulnerability that you talk about? It's not an uh, easy question uh, because it's, um, the situation is more complicated. Uh, they were more lucky with Mac systems because Mac is uh, very vulnerable and uh, recent attacks on Mac, uh, it was an example that uh, well, it's possible to do. Why are not such a so many malware for Mac as it we have for Microsoft Windows, uh, simply because uh, they are, they are ma there are much more software engineers for Microsoft Windows and uh, cyber criminals, they are engineers, the software engineers as well, so it's much more difficult to find malware engineer for Mac, so I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we don't know these guys, but I think it's exactly the same situation. So most of the software engineers are Windows based. Uh, so we don't see 
many attacks, many criminals attacks on Mac, but we see the espionage attacks of on Mac. Mm -hmm. It's quite a lot of them. So about smartphones, uh, it's much more simple to infect Android because Android is open operating system, uh, and it's much more easy to write uh, to develop the software for uh, Android, including malware. It's more easy to distribute it. Uh, it's free system, pretty much the same. Little bit more secure, but pretty much the same like Microsoft Windows. So they are, that's why they are, why most of the malware is written for Microsoft, so to Android. Uh, what about uh, mobile operating system from Microsoft and uh, Symbian? Yes, there are, there are malware for these operating systems as well, but not so, so many because Android is dominating the uh, mobile uh, market together with iOS. And iOS, I think it's, uh, well, it's just a question of time when we have the first malware and I'm afraid it will be a disaster for iPhones and iPads users. Mm. I mean, what you mentioned actually about the, the awareness of the users and the fact that they're not protected at all is perhaps a, a concern in the wider context of security. So, okay, perhaps they don't face the malware threat there on those platforms at the moment, but they do still face potential threats from other aspects around the internet, so phishing scams, for example, and as it currently stands, I guess they don't have any product that they can use on their devices to safeguard against that either. Uh, that's right, and uh, unfortunately many users of these uh, so-called secure systems, uh, which are not secure, uh, unfortunately most of the users, they think they're secure, mm -hmm. uh, well, they are not ready for the attacks, and in case of uh, sophisticated criminal attacks, they will be the very, very easy victims. Uh, example is for last year there was a botnet of 700,000 Mac systems infected at the same time and uh, users, they didn't care at all about security. So I'm afraid that uh, it's more easy to attack uh, Microsoft Windows or Android. Uh, because well, there are more engineers and the technologists uh, to attack the systems. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's much more easy to uh, to make their and uh, to make iOS or Mac user be a victim by using social engineering attacks. Mm. And I suppose what you mentioned also about the wider variety of devices that are going to become potential targets, so the smart TVs, etc., yes, that are exactly, running on the exactly. same platform. Everything. We're going to potentially face the same problem of users having learned the lesson. Well, firstly on traditional PCs, perhaps they'll learn the lesson on mobile devices. Will they then need to relearn the lesson yet again on the different type of physical device because they don't they don't see that the threat can apply in that wider context? Uh, yes, and I think it's a sec model is the same story which happened uh, in the past with uh, um, trains, electricity, cars, <laughs> planes, and all these uh, big innovations which change the world. Uh, so I'm afraid in the future they are users of, well, everyone will need to learn more and more about IT security. Uh, it's not only because of the new smart TV or new devices, mm. new pocket. Uh, it's also because of our, our, the rest of the environment is getting more and more computerized. Uh, what about smart homes? Smart homes, mm -hmm. which is, uh, well, this is a, a SCADA, so-called SCADA system. Uh, and uh, uh, what about uh, the future, maybe in 10, 20 or maybe 50 years from now, I think 20. Uh, many, many homes, they will be managed by IT systems and they will have the IP address connected to the internet mm -hmm. and they, they will be SCADA based <laughs> systems. Uh, unfortunately, even now it's possible to find many hundreds, maybe thousands SCADA which run well, the, the home environment. Mm -hmm. um, so this is one more scenario for cyber attacks and one more way for security and education. Yeah, and I think we'll, we'll return certainly to that theme of awareness and education later on within the questioning. Before we get to that, though, I've got a specific question from one of our students. that uh, He flags up that during a recent conference panel, um, the European Director of Kaspersky Lab's Global Research and Analysis Team expressed the opinion that both cyber espionage and cyber sabotage can be considered methods of cyber warfare and then therefore a declaration of cyber war. Do you share that view? And if so, how would you propose fighting an offensive war in this context where the perpetrators of cyber attacks are often anonymous and without attribution? 
That's a very good question and I probably share this opinion. Uh, and this is one of the main differences between traditional world, the real world and cyber world. Well, cyber world is real as well, but called traditional world. Mm -hmm. If there's a high profile, high complexity espionage attack, uh, it's not possible to convert it to the cyber sabotage because you, have to, you need to take the spy out of this place and send the troop there. Mm -hmm. uh, in the cyberspace, if uh, there is a high complexity espionage attack with big enough budget behind it, uh, and big enough budgets, I mean, some maybe million pounds, maybe 10 million pounds, maybe 100 mm -hmm. behind some of the attacks because they were you know, really massive scale. Uh, so it means that uh, there are people which are behind this attack, they have a very good budgeting and I'm pretty sure there are states behind these attacks. So it's state-sponsored attacks. Uh, it means that states they have uh, access not only for their IT uh, networks information, but also to their uh, industrial stuff, uh, data about, well, power plants data, what else, power grids, transportation, and having access to IT systems which are infected by espionage attack, it's very easy to convert it to the cyber weapon. You don't need to send a troop, just click a button mm -hmm. to upgrade the system with a warhead. So the cyber espionage attacks, it's like a missile without warhead. So this is the difference with a traditional world. Uh, even a very professional spy, it's not a missile. Mm -hmm. uh, in cyberspace is different. So that's why I partly share this opinion that high complexity, high profile espionage attacks, they are cyber weapons or almost cyber weapons. And that's why they are very, very dangerous. Because the bad guys which are watching, which are maybe outside of this game, uh, which are infected well, just by the random, they are random victims of this attack, they can learn from this missile, uh, they can build similar one. It's a software, it's very easy mm -hmm. to copy past technologies and upgrade it with their own warhead. So they've already got so far into the process yeah, that exactly, uh, it exactly. represents a, a danger it's by a, that. Yes, it's a, the, this one more difference uh, uh, the traditional weapons and cyber weapon. Uh, it's not possible to learn cyber. Uh, it's not possible to learn cruise missile after it was used. Mm. <laughs> it's possible to use cyber weapon after it was used. So it's different. And uh, even when you have the the real uh, cruise missile in your hand. You need to have access to so many technologies to copy that. Because it's, it's a huge work. If it's software, the cyber, cyber weapon, it's software. You need just to have some, some software engineers to, have, to, to, to disassemble that and to learn that. I That's suppose it. on the smaller scale we've already seen that many, many times with the different strains of malware that the original strain emerges and then somebody and somebody else is yes, modifying. Yes, yes, learn, yeah. modify yeah. and use it. Mm. Okay, moving back to, I suppose, the more general landscape of security and thinking about the security technologies that we use today as individuals and as organizations, are you surprised that some of the approaches in use are still persisting um, and haven't been replaced with something better? So, for example, let's say password technology is the basis for authentication. Well, I think that, that there were some technologies which we don't use for years, we just forgot about them. Uh, because there's some technologies they are really they are upgraded with the uh, new ones, uh, but some technologies they will stay forever. Uh, it's like um, in our in the car security, they will still have a seat belt. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an old technology. It's a very primitive technology, but it's, it still works. Mm -hmm. So why don't you use it if it works? Uh, so our modern uh, IT security systems, it's a combination of the old good technologies, but they're not old. It's old ideas which are upgraded many times. Mm -hmm. They are very modern, but the same, they use the old ideas. And the new ideas, new technologies. Um, so it's a balance. It's a balance of uh, old and new technologies, and I think many of these technologies will stay forever. Uh, what about passwords? Um, I think it's a very good idea if you still have some kind of finger-typed <laughs> passwords, uh, but uh, they are the question is of their reasonable managing of mm -hmm. the passports. 
and a reasonable size and maybe these passwords will stay forever but only to unlock your uh, main uh, main passwords or like this so combination of maybe your fingerprint mm -hmm. the, the traditional passport and fingerprint or maybe some more biometric data mm -hmm. why yeah. not I mean, people have been predicting the demise of passwords and certainly suggesting that we need to move beyond them for years, but it's that issue of having something that is applicable enough to use across all the different devices that you might be needing to use. Uh, the password is good, and I think it will stay forever, or maybe for, well, for, for years with us. Uh, the question is about password manager, mm -hmm. and, uh, well, actually, I think the technology will be moved more uh, to the online storage of your passwords and uh, you have access to your storage only if you guarantee it's you with maybe biometric uh, data mm -hmm. maybe with, with one very strong password which you can remember but it's one mm -hmm. and of course it's a very good idea to use different passwords for different uh, social media by different internet uh, services you use better use more strong uh, system but it's still uh, on the way i'm talking about internet passports Okay, so I mean that's, that's an issue that came up in one of the other questions that we had. So you've spoken a number of times about the Internet Passport and that would be a means of ensuring the accountability for users' activities online. Is this an idea that you still support and how might it become a reality given the current culture that we've got as online users where we're not being that strongly bound to our identity and our yeah. activities and the use of the network having grown yeah. around that context? Uh, I still believe that this... Uh idea of internet passwords will become a uh, reality sooner or later. It's the same like I was talking about internet Interpol for many years and mm -hmm. people were smiling on me. Uh, but now the next year Inter Interpol is opening the cyber division uh, in Singapore and actually we are assisting them. So that became true about internet passports. I think it will happen. Uh, and some countries already tried, in, in Europe they tried to, to introduce some kind of the internet plastic cards to access some internet resources uh, but still if they are vulnerable it's still possible to uh, bypass this protection uh, so I believe in the future we'll have uh, um, different areas in the internet different zones uh, there will be a very free zone so you don't need to have any passport any ID to get access to this zone uh, internet news, email, your personal data, mm. your, your communication with friends, um, your blog. And uh, there will be uh, critical internet services. And, well, you need, you need to uh, confirm that it's you. You need to identify yourself. Uh, it's like uh, online banking or well, other online services which are critical. And somewhere in between, uh, the gray area. Mm. Uh, where you don't really need to identify yourself, but just a little bit, just some piece of information to confirm that you are a real person. Uh, and I am absolutely sure it will happen, uh, simply because of uh, elections. Uh, the new generation, the students, uh, kids, they are born in the internet time. And they don't really understand what's that, to have their access to walk to the office if you well in, you, you may have access online access to the same service uh, but elections is very critical because if it's hijacked if it's hacked uh, it will be a major problem uh, so their their high demand of uh, highly secure connection to the online election systems what's that that's an internet passport <laughs> that's it okay. so because of this uh, uh, issues with uh, online elections, we will be forced, governments will be forced to issue the internet passports. If not, in 10, 15, maybe 20 years, that will be the end of democracy. There will be nobody to walk to the election mm -hmm. office. So it's a combination of, well, in this particular case, if you like, a killer app that will require that and demand, well, consequently from government there to ensure that that can't be compromised. Do you see it being a, a level of demand from the end users themselves for this sort of thing, or do you think it will be that they will want to use particular services in that way and therefore government will have the demand that they use it properly? Very good question about user behaviour. Mm. Uh, I think that uh, governments and uh, businesses 
uh, they have to lead the situation. So I think that, for example, in bank services, I think the banks, they, they have to offer options for customers. If you want to be 100% safe and secure, and banks guarantee all the risks, so please use more strict and more secure system. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to use that, you are free to use a less secure, but banks, they don't guarantee the risk. Mm -hmm. Up to you. Uh, the option, you may use this uh, card to identify yourself in the internet, so you can vote online. If not, please walk to you, to the election office. Okay, government services. You may access to the government services only in case you have this card. If not, you are welcome to the traditional office. So I think that within a very short period of time, people will change their mind and they will follow their more secure, uh, well, a little bit more complicated, mm -hmm. but more secure internet services. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned complexity there, and that links nicely to the next question that I've got for you around the issue of are the technologies that people are, in some cases, required, in some cases, have the option to use, are they usable enough? To what, to what extent do users have to understand the technology that they're dealing with in order to ensure that they're able to use it to protect themselves properly? Yeah, I think technologies, they must be as simple as it possible for users to use them. Uh, well, I said it in a little bit wrong way. Products must be as simple as it's mm -hmm. possible to let, the user, to, anyone, to let anyone to use it. Technologies, they, they can be as complicated as they won't be, but they have to be hidden by the product features. Uh, it's like in the cars. Well, I, must, I like to, to, to just just to compare that as cars. Uh, in cars, there are a lot of security which we don't see. We simply know how to drive the car, and we know how to drive it in a secure way. Unfortunately, many people drive it in an insecure way. But it's question about it's question of education. It's question about. Uh, the ways how people behave in the street. So the same in the internet, same in the cyberspace. Uh, there have to be technologies and products which are easy to use, so anybody can use it. At the same time, there is a place for education uh, to explain people the right ways and the wrong ways of internet behavior or mobile networks behavior. So in terms of the, of the products, then, I quite agree with you, it is actually the way it's, it's presented at the end of the mm -hmm. day to the users. I mean, at the moment, do you think we're getting there? Do you think we're close enough? I mean, I'm thinking in terms of, for example, the degree to which you still see a fair amount of technical terminology within some of the products, not <laughs> just security <laughs> products, but the general IT applications and services that people are required to use and then when they're confronted with a in some cases a security related decision their ability to make an informed decision seems to rely on their understanding of the jargon yeah. and the system that's going on i think it's a price we have to pay uh, because the new technologies new products uh, internet cyberspace mobile networks um, the new technology which will appear in the market uh, it's a new services, it's a new features of our life. And unfortunately, we have to learn more about that and we have to learn more terms. We have to learn better behavior in a new environment. So I think it's, a, it's a just a question of education. Uh, before cars were introduced, we didn't have this... Uh, uh, we didn't teach our kids that before crossing the street, we have to left look left, right, I don't know, depend on the, depending on the country, maybe both sides. <laughs> so I think it's uh, like uh, teaching the kids uh, to look around before you cross, and it's the same in the new cyber, with new cyber technologies, new, new, new devices and new services. I think that's a very fair point, that there is a, an unavoidable overhead that comes from the advantage of having the new systems available to us. And that links into the, I suppose, the next question. I disagree. I disagree with you, actually. Uh, because all new technologies and uh, new services, they make our life more simple and more easy. Uh, we don't need to run any more use cars. Uh, we don't need to write mails okay. by hand, we, we, use, we use Skype. So, so, so one <laughs> aspect of our effort is saved, but we, we need to recognize that it doesn't come completely free. We've got to have something that takes a little bit more effort on the other side to, to be able to leverage the benefit 
from the main advantage, if you like. Well, yes, people are getting more and more lazy. Mm. <laughs> that's, and, that's and perhaps, <laughs> I suppose, perhaps the thing, and this links into the next question, perhaps they don't have that awareness that there's something that they need to know. And I wonder whether you think enough is done to raise public awareness of the threat landscape that we talked about earlier. So people are very very much marketed around the advantages that the different services can provide for them. So they, they can have a mobile device and that's very flexible. Yep, they can yep. use social networks. They can use online banking. And perhaps in the last context, the online banking, they realise there's something they need to protect. It's their money. But in the other context, perhaps they see the benefit of the system that's marketed to them but, but aren't told so much about the risk and therefore need to have more education around that aspect. Uh, there is no such a word enough in a cyberspace. Uh, we're living in a very interesting time. It's a time of uh, cyber cyberspace. It's innovations, new technologies, new services. It's everywhere. And uh, just just remember there our life 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. 30 years ago, no computers, no mobile phones, no internet. 20 years ago, uh, that was all. Okay, so 20 years ago, we had internet, but there were no mobile phones. Uh, so this world has been changing so quick. It's uh, all the time. It's a new one. Uh, so it's no no such a word enough uh, enough of education uh, in a in an area in a space which is changed year by year. We have to learn more. Uh, so that's that, that. We have to change as well because mm. this environment is being mm. changed. So we have to learn more. We have to change. We have to be more better ready for all these uh, uh, new products and new threats which follow I mean, do you think then, products. I mean, I'll take the point about enough, actually. Um, do you think the gap is widening then between what people ought to know and what they actually know? Or do you think there's just, a, if you like, a consistent lag between where people are operating and where they ought to be in order to be safer? I think this, this gap probably can be too wide. So I think it's a balance between... Uh, user behavior and uh, their, uh, the risks they face. So if they behave uh, in a wrong way, so they're victims. So they learn and they behave better. So I think it's a balance. Mm. So the gap is still the same. Uh, thanks to new technologies and <laughs> thanks to cyber criminals. <laughs> which educate the users from other hand, <laughs> from other side. <laughs> So, from Kaspersky Labs' perspective, what, what does the company do to promote the security education agenda? Uh, we do quite a lot, so we are cooperating with universities everywhere around the globe, uh, including Plymouth University, and we provide our education, IT security education program. Uh, we, have, we call it uh, Kaspersky Academy. Uh, we have uh, the student conferences also everywhere around the globe. I don't, have, I don't know how many conferences we have a year. Um, so we are very active in uh, sharing our experience and our knowledge with our universities. Uh, and we are doing quite a lot and I hope we will do even more. Excellent. And so a final question then to draw things to a close. What, what, what do you think are the key things that need to be done in order to protect our society from cyber threats, if you can sum that up in a sentence or two? In short, of course, it's technologies and products to guarantee that our devices, computers, smartphones, they are protected. Uh, second, uh, that's uh, learning, it's education, uh, to behave in a safe way in a cyberspace. Uh, third, it's a government and international uh, regulation. Um, it's about IT regulation and uh, cyber police investigations. Uh, that's why I was talking about uh, Internet Interpol because I was I was dreaming about this uh, this organization for many years. So there's actually quite a number of actions divided across the responsibilities yeah. of a number of different actors. Though. Yeah, that's right. Excellent. Eugene, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you very much for the questions and for the opportunity to talk to you.